Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. David Rubenstein is with us. David Rubenstein is an amazing investor, a legendary patriotic philanthropist, a talk show host without peer. His show, Peer to Peer, is featured on Bloomberg TV. And of course, he's an author. This is his second book, which is called How to Lead. And it's a series of interviews with 31 of the outstanding personalities of our time. And we're delighted to welcome David Rubenstein back to the program. Jim, thank you very much for having me. Well, let's uh, talk about your book. Uh, it's uh, a bestseller. One of your subjects is Jeff Bezos, who founded Amazon. So uh, maybe that's why you're on the Amazon bestseller list. But uh, in any event, uh, it's an amazing book. And tell us how you came to write it. Well, what happened was I became the president of the Economic Club of Washington about a dozen years ago. Vernon Jordan asked me to succeed him. And I really didn't know much about the club, but he said, just get speakers and you can, um, you know, get questions from the members afterwards and then read the questions when, when the, the speaker's done. It turned out that the speakers were a little boring. And when I would get questions from the members, they weren't so wonderful either. So I would make up the questions. They were a little humorous. People laughed. And I said, maybe I can make the interviews uh, of, of, of these people better than the speeches. And so I began interviewing them and then I would intersperse some humor and then the Bloomberg people saw it. They said, go on TV and do this. I did that. And I took about, I've done about 200 interviews for Bloomberg on peer to peer. And I took about 30 of them and put them into a book. And uh, is the book uh, really a sequel to your prior book, The American Story? Well, it is in a sense that it's basically a compilation of interviews where I have some uh, commentary on them. That book was about interviews I had done of great American historians in front of members of Congress in a program I started to educate members of Congress about history. This is not just about history. It's about the lives of people, but I focused on their leadership qualities. What made them leaders? You know, it's a combination. You want to have diversity, uh, gender diversity, uh, ethnic diversity. You want to have diversity in terms of, of the backgrounds of the people. And then ultimately you want people who are well known and have an interesting interview. So I could do another book with another 30 uh, and maybe I'll do that at some point. Uh, well, we'll look forward to that. But uh, looking through the book, uh, you see that uh, almost all the people uh, that you interviewed were kind of an only in America story. These are not people born to great wealth. These are not uh, plutocrats, aristocrats. Uh, they were people who uh, were self-made and uh, very much like yourself. Uh, was that a factor in, in how you approached it? Well, actually, uh, if you take a look at the people that are the great leaders in any part of society, they rarely are people who grew, grew up in great wealth. Obviously, some people in great wealth have done very important things, but generally the people uh, had backgrounds where they came from blue collar or lower middle class backgrounds, with obviously some exceptions. But generally, they were not plutocrats, I would say. That's probably true. Of course, one of the uh, people that you uh, admire most, and it's a great section of the book, and uh, is a person who's the subject of a new biography by uh, Peter Baker and his wife, Susan Glasser, uh, it's James Baker, uh, not related to Peter Baker. But uh, now, uh, James Baker wasn't born to great wealth, but his uh, father and grandfather were lawyers. Uh, he certainly came from a uh, substantial background. Well, he came from what I would call old money, which means not that much money. Well, is that worth as much as new money? I mean, uh, can I well, take it? Well, new money usually is bigger than old money. So <laughs> old money is usually uh, families that have, you know, a lot of privilege and so forth. They're not fabulously wealthy. His family had been lawyers, but they were not poor for sure. And they obviously had a better upbringing in terms of wealth than I did. But Jim basically did this on his own. It, it, he became famous in Washington, where his background in Houston was not that relevant. It was basically his skill set in Washington that really made a difference. And I greatly admired him and he recruited him to my firm, where he was a partner for 12 years, because look what he had done as Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, uh, White House Chief of Staff, a really incredible person. Um, yes, uh, he certainly was. Now, among your 31 are two presidents, uh, President uh, Clinton and uh, President Bush, 43. Uh, now, they both, in uh, some respects, failed as leaders, uh, but you selected them nonetheless. Was it that they were presidents or that they had uh, some particular distinction as leaders? 
Well, people are always interested in hearing from presidents. And uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was an advisor to my firm. Through him, I got to know George W. Bush. Bill Clinton was a Democratic president. The previous Democratic president was Jimmy Carter, for whom I worked. So I knew both of them. But they came together to start a presidential scholars program. I've been a supporter of that. And they asked me to come and interview them at one of their gatherings. And so I did. And it, the advantage of it was when you're a former president, your hair can be let down a bit. You're looser. And you can see from the interview, they're quite quite uh, jocular about uh, things, and they had a pretty good sense of humor, I would say. Uh, now, you uh, have a number of outstanding people. We can almost uh, group them together uh, with the Baker, uh, including Oprah Winfrey, Jamie Dimon, uh, and Anthony Fauci. Now, uh, Tony Fauci is really an American legend, came from Brooklyn, speaks with a Brooklyn accent. He almost exemplifies uh, what you were after here. Correct. Uh, his brother-in-law was in my firm for about a dozen years, and through his brother-in-law, I originally got to know him many years ago. And as I point out in the book, I actually thought when he turned 70, he should retire and join the higher calling of private equity and let me, uh, you know, have him be involved in our healthcare business. But he said to me, David, I don't really care about money. I only care about it saving lives. And so I'm not interested. And so now he's just about 80 years old, and he's still working, I think, on behalf of the country. I think he's a great national hero. And I think he's put up with a lot in the recent uh, couple months that uh, hopefully uh, he won't have to put up with in the future. Uh, it's almost an American tragedy that we've politicized science in this way, haven't we? We should be focused on saving lives and not uh, who gets credit for it. I would say uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we have politicized uh, this coronavirus situation. Hopefully that will be behind us in the near future. David. Talk a little bit about the women whom you included as decision makers in your book. Uh, they would be Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, Christine Lagarde, and uh, who's now the chair of the European Central Bank, and Nancy Pelosi. Well, it's interesting. The word history is really, it says H-I-S, his story. That's because men used to be dominant in everything and walk of life practically, and they used to write the histories. Now we find that uh, half the population has leadership skills that we didn't quite let them uh, exhibit before. So a lot of the great leaders in the world are now women. I interviewed a few of them. They're people that I know reasonably well, and I thought it was uh, important that they be included, not because they're women, but because they've done incredible things. Uh, well, that's why uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, said, which I think you, you purchased a copy of it and gave it to the country, but uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence said, well, men are created equal. I suppose if it were written today, it would say all men and women are created equal. Thomas Jefferson wrote that, and at the time, the idea that women would be included was not, not even a starter. In fact, in those days, in colonial days, if you were a woman and you were married, you were not allowed to own property in your own name. And Abigail Adams famously wrote to her husband, John Adams, and said, when you're making these laws, don't forget the women. But of course, they did. Yes. Um, in fact, they didn't even get the vote until 100 years ago, which is, is an absolutely amazing fact. Uh, but let me ask you about sports figures. Uh, you seem to have a certain bias toward basketball. You have Tony Fauci. He played basketball in Brooklyn. But uh, you also have Coach K from your own uh, Duke University. Uh, you have Adam Silver, the uh, NBA commissioner. Uh, and you have uh, uh, Phil Knight was a basketball player who created Nike. I mean, uh, are you kind of uh, basketball driven? Well, I did go to Duke University. I was chairman of the board for a while, so I got to know Coach K. And Adam Silver is a Duke graduate, and I helped get him on the Duke University board, where he's done a great job. Well, you didn't spare the uh, performing arts from uh, your selection, and you have Yo-Yo uh, uh, Ma and Renee Fleming. Uh, are you a music buff? Or do you, uh, are you, do you go to the opera? Do you uh, go to concerts? Well, I was the vice chairman of the of Lincoln Center for many years, and I've now been on the board for about uh, 20 years. And I am the chairman of the Kennedy Center. I've been the chairman for the last 10 years. And we do have opera at the Kennedy Center. So yes, I do go to opera, and I do go to symphonies, and I really enjoy classical music. So I was really thrilled to have Renee Fleming in the book and Yo-Yo Ma in the book. But other kinds of culture I had as well. I had Lauren Michaels who produces uh, Saturday Night Live and has for about 45 years. Well, that's more in line with your skills because you have an amazing sense of humor, which you've brought to your talk show. So it's understandable you'd have Lorne Michaels, but are you an opera buff? You like to go to the opera? 
I wouldn't say I'm an opera buff. I say I have learned to uh, like it much more than I did 25 years ago, but I'm no uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She loved opera and Antonin Scalia loved opera and they would come all the time. And so I, I would say it's an acquired taste on my, on my part. Now, uh, you're uh, 31 subjects, 10 are women, uh, four African-American, two Asian-Americans. Uh, do you uh, believe in this age of diversity and inclusion? You might have included more of, uh, of these uh, minority groups. Well, in, uh, diversity and inclusion is an important part of our society. When you think about it, when the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution under which we're now living was drafted, it was all white, male, Christian property owners, more or less. And interestingly, we now have a very diverse society. I think by the year 2040, uh, whites will be a minority in our, in our society. So I think it's important to be successful today to recognize the diversity and the value of diversity in our society. So I tried in my book to have some diversity and I can always do better, but I, I think it's reasonably diverse. Uh, I think you often say uh, in the introduction to your talk show, uh, I don't consider myself a journalist. And um, I guess you don't consider yourself a journalist, but in interviewing people like uh, Clinton, Presidents Clinton and Bush, uh, General Petraeus, uh, you uh, really didn't go into uh, uh, some of their failures. Uh, although you say failure is a, an element of leadership, uh, was there some reason for this uh, in, uh, in your approach? Well, yes. Um, my job is not to be a journalist. There are more than enough journalists out there, and there's nothing that I'm going to add to what they can do. So when I'm interviewing somebody, what I want to do is to have them relax. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to be able to be spontaneous. And I think that wouldn't be possible if I said, oh, by the way, tell me about this mistake you made that was very embarrassing. Or tell me about this personal flaw you have that's very embarrassing. So I don't really do that. There are other people that can do that, and people can judge whether they want to watch what I do or not. Well, you did press uh, Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell on the decision to uh, go into Iraq, and I was curious why you didn't really cover that with uh, President Bush. Well, President Bush was a uh, um, interview where I was doing with Bill Clinton, and I just it was I was really talking about there what the presidency was and so forth, and I didn't think, given the tone of it. Uh, that President Bush was going to say anything different about Iraq than he previously said before. What he said about it for, you know, from the time that he started into Iraq is pretty clear, and I didn't think I was going to add anything to that. And what I'm trying to do is to get people to say things they haven't said before. And so if I asked President Bush about, uh, about Iraq, I didn't think he was going to say, you know what, I've been wanting to tell people that I made a mistake there. I, I didn't think he was going to say that. So I thought it'd be better to ask questions that people don't usually ask him. Well, you did that. Um, so what would you say are the elements that go into a great leader? Well, I tried in my book to say these are the qualities that I admire and that I think are. Obviously, there have been courses written, books written, and an enormous amount of courses taught on leadership. But the ones I think are important are luck, because you have to have some luck to get where you're going to go. You have to have a vision of where you want to go. You have to have hard work, focus on what you want to do, narrow your interests so you're focused for a while. You have to share the credit. You don't have to communicate with your followers. I think integrity is important. And I also think that humility is important. Now, obviously, leaders we know, uh, you and I know, are not always uh, humble. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of arrogance. And I suspect that Napoleon was arrogant. I suspect Alexander the Great, who attached the Great to his name, was probably arrogant. But the people that I admire probably are people that are more humble. Um. Yes, although there's a certain amount of ego that goes into being a leader, isn't there? You can't be self-effacing and be a great leader. I think it's possible to be relatively modest and self-effacing. I, I met Nelson Mandela, and I would say they didn't have a gigantic ego. Uh, obviously, if you're going to be a leader, you have to say to people, follow me, or you have to want people to follow you. You have to be happy they're following you, and there, there's so, some ego in that. But you can have ego without being overwhelming in your arrogance about it or telling people how powerful or how brilliant you are, I do think that that's possible. But sure, if you're going to be a leader, you have to have some ego because otherwise you wouldn't want to be a leader. Uh, by the way, we went into sports and uh, there seems to be, particularly these days, an intersection between sports and politics. And I think in your interview with Adam Silver, you went into 
uh, his uh, decision to support players who uh, uh, were, uh, uh, went on strike following the killing of Jacob Blake. Uh, and uh, so do you believe that there's a place for politics and sports? I mean, do you admire uh, uh, players who refuse to take the knee uh, or who took the knee? Uh, well, tradi Black Lives Matter. Well, traditionally, um, athletes were athletes and they weren't supposed to do anything else. Um, now, I think we recognize that athletes have brains, they have a role in society, and they shouldn't be just closed off from the issues that affect society. So I don't have any problem with athletes saying what their views are uh, on things. And, and I, it doesn't bother me particularly if done in a respectful and, and a way that makes the message, but doesn't detract from the overall uh, sport that they're trying to be part of. Well, Adam Silver thought it was a mistake that the NFL expelled Kaepernick. Uh, did you agree with him? Well, I think the NFL has said that now. I think the commissioner of the NFL, Charles, uh, Commissioner Goodell, has said that he thinks it was a mistake. And uh, so I, but my, my saying it was a mistake wouldn't be really uh, newsworthy because I think everybody is now saying it's a mistake. It was a mistake. Uh, may we uh, touch on uh, philanthropy? Uh, you have uh, endorsed the Giving Pledge. You have uh, become a member of the Giving Pledge along with Warren Buffett, whom you interviewed. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Giving Pledge and what your thinking was? The Giving Pledge is a, uh, informal agreement that people sign up to, but it's not binding in law, which says you're going to give away half your net worth during your lifetime or upon your death. Uh, initially, there were 40 of us who signed, and now they're about 220. And basically, it's trying to say to people, philanthropy is a good thing, encourage people to give away more. But there aren't enough people that have signed it to have a big impact on the world, unless other people who are not signers or people who are not wealthy enough to be a part of the Giving Pledge are, are beginning to do more. So my goal is to get everybody to recognize that philanthropy should be a part of their life, not just by giving away money, but giving away their time and their energy and their ideas. Time is much more valuable than your money because you can't get your time back. I think the giving pledge has had a reasonable uh, impact, but it's not going to solve all the world's problems. There just aren't enough wealthy people to solve all the world's problems through philanthropy. Well, it's interesting that a great deal of uh, your philanthropy has been patriotic philanthropy. Uh, uh, the uh, refurbishing of the Washington Monument of Monticello, of Montpelier, where James Madison lived. Uh, but the proceeds of your book are given to the Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Does this represent a shift in your uh, emphasis? Well, um, that 90% of my money goes to health and education, and has always been. About 10% goes to what I've called patriotic philanthropy. It gets 90% of the attention because very few people are doing it. So I put up, uh, let's suppose at, at uh, Sloan Kettering, I, let's suppose I've given a very large sum for Pancreatic Cancer Center. Uh, the amount of money I put up there dwarfs the amount of money that I put up to fix the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, but other people aren't doing it, so it gets more attention. Now, uh, you worked uh, for a time in the Carter White House, uh, so uh, that is uh, certainly part of your background where you were so close to power. And you uh, certainly weren't uh, too shy to ask Condoleezza Rice or Colin Powell whether they uh, ever thought of uh, running for president or whether they would think of running for president. Would you ever think of running for president, David? I thought of running for president of the student government maybe once. But um, no, I don't think people who've been in the private equity world are probably going to be that popular if they were to run for office. And so there hasn't been any great demand for me to get back in government. I was in government when I got inflation to 19%, interest rates to 15%, <laughs> and I got a feeling people might remind voters of that. So I'm quite content in doing what I'm doing now. And again, I don't think there's been any great demand. Also, I have the problem that I'm too young. Um, I'm only 71 years old. And if you're gonna be president of the United States, you gotta be like 78 or something like that. So I'm just too young. And maybe when I get a little more mature, I might consider it. Um, well, uh, we can wait and we can hope. Uh, perhaps you'll campaign against uh, the carried interest. We don't know. You never know. I, I do think that, uh, look, if President Trump had said, uh, I want to support carried interest, maybe he would have been reelected. I, I think that was a key provision uh, that people didn't campaign on. Okay, now you've mentioned President Trump. Uh, did you consider adding him to uh, this illustrious list of leaders? I, I did interview President Trump before he was president at the Economic Club of Washington. He came in, and he loved the interview, said it was one of the best he'd ever had. And um, I, I, I didn't, 
I was going to interview him uh, subsequently, and I, I went to the Oval Office to see him about, about a year ago to talk about letting me do another interview, and we just couldn't get it scheduled when the pandemic came up and so forth. So, but I'm happy to interview him again. I hope I have a chance to interview him again. And I would like to ask him, what was the presidency really like? And was it up everything you thought it would be? And, and see whether he'd be happy to talk about things he did right or things he did wrong and what he's learned. But I suspect that uh, he will probably run again. So uh, we'll have a more opportunity to know his views on the presidency soon. Well, he claims he's been reelected, so he uh, might be constitutionally barred from running again. Well, if he serves, obviously, yes. But if he doesn't serve again, he would be eligible to run again, and he'd be the same age in, uh, in, in four years as Joe Biden is now. So uh, you, you never know what's going to happen. But um, he wasn't in this book. Uh, if I get to interview him again, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Has he been an effective leader in your view? Well, when you think about it, um, to be very serious, he got 73 million people that voted for him. 73 million people, more than anybody in the history of our country except for Joe Biden this time. So he was very effective with respect to his base. When you think about it, the people that voted for him are more intensely supportive than probably any president we've ever had with respect to their base. Even Ronald Reagan's base wasn't quite as supportive, I think, as Donald Trump's base is. So he's an effective leader of his base. I think he was. Was he an effective leader of the people that didn't support him? Not, not so much. The 79 million. So uh, do you think it's been counterproductive that he hasn't conceded? I think the country will, would be better off if we were to move forward with a smooth transition. I think everybody would agree on that. And I suspect at some point we'll get a smoother transition than we've had now. Um, as you know, uh, uh, it is often said that when you have a, a, a defeat or something bad happens, it takes there are several stages of grief. And uh, one of them is denial and eventually there is acceptance. So I think we're not yet at the acceptance stage, but I suspect we'll get there soon. Uh, has it, in your view, damaged the country that uh, there hasn't been, I mean, Tony Fauci says so, a, a smooth uh, transition in the area of uh, the fight against uh, the coronavirus? I would say a smooth transition would be better than what we currently have. There's no doubt about it. But I do think that uh, President-elect Biden's people are very knowledgeable about the pandemic and very knowledgeable about health care. And I do think that in time, before uh, January 20th, there will be a smoother transition than we have today. I'm very hopeful of that. And I do think that at some point, um, the, the health care efforts of uh, uh, President-elect Biden will, will produce um, some benefits. I do think that that is the country's biggest problem right now, is solving this pandemic. That is number one. Number two is the economy. Do you think Biden is a better manager of the economy than Trump? Many voters suggested as they left the polling place that uh, he was not. Uh, I've known Joe Biden for a long time, and I think he's uh, got a lot of experience. Remember, eight years as vice president and some 30 years in the Senate. So he's got a wealth of experience. And he knows a lot of people, and he's got some really good people around him. And I think that those people will, will, will do a pretty good job in managing the economy. But remember, presidents do not really control economies. Uh, we have in recent decades given the president the responsibility of controlling the economy. That really wasn't what was intended when the presidency was set up. So I think the president has some ability to affect the economy, but he can't really control it. There are too many other uh, factors out there. But I think President-elect Biden will have some impact in fixing the problem we currently now have, which is that we are still in a low growth, high unemployment uh, situation that's not desirable. So with uh, 73 million people behind him, do you think that uh, Trump will try to uh, perhaps stage a counter inauguration and uh, be a shadow president and uh, uh, cause Biden to have a failed presidency? Well, I would say that if I had run for president and gotten 73 million votes, I probably wouldn't just uh, slink away, go down to Mar-a-Lago and not say anything again. I suspect that uh, he will be an active force on Twitter, on TV, on a radio, again, and a lot of people are, are really influenced by him. So um, he would say, I'm not speaking for him, but he would say uh, that had there not been a pandemic, uh, he would have won overwhelmingly. And he probably was right. And I suspect that the only person who could have beaten him in this election, even with the pandemic, was Joe Biden. I think if uh, Elizabeth Warren or uh, Senator Sanders had been the, of the opponents of the Democratic Party, um, I, I think Trump would have won despite all the things that uh, people were upset about. Uh, well, that's why he recognized that Biden was his likely opponent very early on. It was the subject of the impeachment. But 
Uh, I have a question for you, David Rubenstein. Uh, what best defines a leader in your view? Well, a leader is somebody that is actually able to command the attention and support of followers and to convince them to do what he or she thinks is appropriate. And I think that is the essence of leadership. It's having influence to be able to enable people to follow you. Everybody can't be a, a, a leader. We have to have some followers or we'd have a chaos in our society. So I think a great leader is somebody that figures out how to communicate with other people and really enables them to follow what he or she thinks is the best interest of whatever cause or project they're, they're, in, in, they're leading. Well, you chose 37 of our best leaders for your book. And um, I want to thank you, David Rubenstein, for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, be well, and all the best.